NDU Vice President Ambassador Hoover, distinguished guests, faculty, staff, and fellow students here at McNair and joining online uh, from the Chisoma program at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Welcome to the Chancellor's Lecture Series. We're also happy to welcome many alumni joining us online. This afternoon, I'm honored to introduce our distinguished speaker, the Deputy Commanding General of the United States Army Special Operations Command, Major General Patrick Roberson. General Roberson, sorry sir, false alarm. General Roberson was commissioned into the U.S. Army Infantry Branch and later assessed and selected as a Special Forces Officer. He was assigned to the 10th Special Forces Group where he served as a Detachment Commander, a Company Commander, Battalion XO, and a Battalion Commander. General Roberson completed the War College Fellowship at the School of the Advanced Military Studies before assuming command of the 3rd Special Forces Group. He since served as a DCG for 1st Special Forces Command, where he also served as a DCG for SOGITIF OIR. His other key billets include the USASOC Chief of Staff, the G357 of the U.S. Army Reserve Command, and the Commander of the Special Operations Joint Task Force OIR in Iraq and Syria. His most recent assignment, I think until about a month ago, uh, was the Commanding General of the U.S. Army John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center and School. And on that one, I can speak from firsthand experience. His leadership was transformational. His command responsibilities there included the recruitment, assessment, selection, training, and education of the U.S. Army's civil affairs, psychological operations, and special forces soldiers. In that role, he directed a rapid rewrite of doctrine to better represent RSOF roles in multi-domain operations, large-scale combat operations, and of uh, special interest to, to us here at CISA, irregular warfare. Sir, on behalf of CISA, thank you for taking the time to join us here today. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Major General Roberson. So I think the mic is on, everybody can hear me? Okay, fantastic. So I will, uh, I'll start out, I've, I've been asked to talk about a few things, the irregular warfare could be, can be one, kind of the uh, soft role in this new world that we have out here with the great power competition or strategic competition, I can talk a little bit about that. I could talk about the doctrine piece, however we, we've rewritten a lot of the things that we're doing. I'll talk for about uh, 15, 20 minutes and I will open it up for questions and we can go from there. And no questions off the table, I think recruiting was, a, was something that was brought up earlier that somebody might want to hear about. We can talk, I can talk recruiting from uh, our perspective in uh, the soft world or writ large even to some degree. Okay, so I'm going to start off with uh, integrated deterrence and what uh, it's kind of a uh, ambiguous type of a term. It can be interpreted in a lot of different ways, but I'll just go over like how do I think that it, uh, integrated deterrence um, fits us as in uh, Army SOF and US SOCOM. I think when I think about integrated, I think about what are you integrated with, and then I think about SOF, and I see a lot of partners out here, and I think the first people that we're integrated with uh, in our ability to deter is our partners, and this is one of the value propositions that we bring to the table in SOF is that we are very networked with international partners. You know, could be international partner SOF or you know regular host nation military forces. Could be uh, militias, whatever. But we are integrated with our international partners. I think the other the other piece on integration would be if I could scope it back down is how do we integrate with our joint force? You know, the Navy, Army. I think we have a multi-domain. You know construct right now, cyber, space, air, how are we integrated in, in all that? Are we covering down in all those domains? You know, that's the other way of thinking about it. And then I think, uh, how are we integrated for Army? You know, and, and if you think about the Army in a combined arms kind of a, a way of thinking, how are we integrated with the Army? Mm -hmm. So uh, we should be as soft integrated into all these different things, and I think that gives us a very great uh, power in the deterrence uh, realm. So that's just a kind of a definition of how I like to think about 
integrated deterrence and what we're integrated with. I think when I listened to the Secretary of Defense in one of his speeches, I think he hit more than 14 different you know, areas of integration, but those are the ones that I think are pretty important to us. Um, I was asked earlier, uh, I think this is a great question. Hey, as far as soft goes, you know, we're looking back on 20 years of war where soft played a big role, right? Um, very important, outsized role for our, you know, demographic and size. So what are we going to do in the future? How are we going to, how are we going to, to make an impact? And because it's been brought up to us that, hey, you know, it's great power competition, CT piece is kind of done, and, and by the way, I'm not, I'm not sure that everything that we did was CT, and I'll get into that in a second, but how are you going to contribute uh, to this brave new world that we're entering? And I would say, you know, first of all, over the last 20 years as a soft force, uh, we haven't just done CT. I think most people think about uh, us as just doing man hunting uh, or HBI hunting, we could say. Um, but I would say in the beginning of the first two wars, we did what we'd call classic unconventional warfare, both in Afghanistan and Iraq. We did a lot of foreign internal defense where we built um, partner soft forces in both Iraq and Afghanistan. We did do counterinsurgency operations. We were just talking about some of the programs that we had in Afghanistan, such as village stability operations and uh, Afghan local police, commando programs, et cetera. We had those exact same programs in um, Iraq. And then I would say on the last big piece that we had in OIR, um, to me, fighting against ISIS, there was certainly a component of that that was, you know, they were a terrorist entity by no doubt, but they were also an army, you know, an army that was good enough to basically destroy the Iraqi military and they would have destroyed the Syrian military uh, also. So there was a kind of a large scale combat operations piece that SOF uh, had an outsized uh, piece to as well. So if we look back on that, I think the way that we have to look back on it, we have to say, okay, what did I learn as a formation over those last 20 years and what can I take and apply you know, into the future, right? Whether it's some of the targeting things that we did, definitely the partnering that we did. Um, I think that we, as a soft force, got a lot better at our trade over the last 20 years. We, we were able to professionalize ourselves in a lot of different ways. There are things that we did over the last 20 years on the command and control side uh, that are different, the technology side. On the command and control side, I can just say, we fought for about 10 years in Vietnam. During that time in Vietnam, as a soft formation, we only ever had a 06 command and control node in Vietnam. By the time we finished fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan, we had figured out that, hey, we have to have at least a two-star type of headquarters in country because that's what actually allows us to integrate and to fight uh, in a better way. And I think that's a more effective way. I think that's one of the things that we've taken away from there. On the technology side, I would just say that most, most of the technological innovation that was happening on the battlefield over the last 20 years was driven, maybe not all of it, but a lot of it was driven by SOF, right? Even the idea of, the, of UAS, which seems to be a big part of uh, large-scale combat operations, right, in the Ukraine or Nagorno-Karabakh or any place like that, the idea of sensing the battlefield and how do you sense, how do you detect, I think we pioneered a lot of that. And we can take all of those things and apply them you know, towards uh, this great power competition area that we're in. I'd also like to talk a little bit about kind of this is how I see you know, this, this battlefield that we have, or not battlefield, but just the world that we're operating in, right? I think there's a competition piece to it, right? Uh, um, and then there's a, hey, how does, how does our military see um, a fight, and what do you have to prepare for in this, in a large scale combat operation, right? And I think for us in SOF, at least in, in uh, American uh, military, on the competition side, we go and deploy, whether it's a joint combined exchange training, a uh, mobile training team, we are always out and about in different countries uh, working with our partners. 
Now that's outside of like a joint exercise, uh, you know, that we would do like in a flintlock or something like that. These are just continuously deploying and going heel to toe in certain areas. Um, Ukraine was a good example of where we had heel to toe presence for years, uh, working with a host nation force prior to uh, hostilities erupting. But the idea of going forward and working with a host nation force, uh, that is, you can call that under the irregular warfare banner, that is something that we do and we do it very well. I think that's something that we cannot uh, underrate in what's our contribution to the, uh, to the competition piece. If, if you go forward and think about, okay, what is uh, your contribution to uh, large-scale combat operations? That's one of the, the Army terms that they use, large-scale combat, because that's how the Army sees its role in the future. And we have to talk to the Army about, hey, how do we fit into this? Um, we usually start talking about, you know, well, our value is we're continuously in what we'd call the contact layer. You know, we're up close and personal in seeing you know, our competitors in different countries and different areas. Um, if hostilities break out someplace, uh, we're there. We don't, we don't have to get there. We are usually there before the fight ever breaks out. We're extremely familiar with that um, environment, both the, the human geography, the physical geography, uh, all this kind of business. So those are a couple of different thoughts uh, on value in the fight itself. Uh, I would, we always talk about the deep fight, right? The idea that, hey, what you see in the Ukraine right now, where there's a resistance element, how are, how are, how are these folks operating? The idea that there would be a resistance, that resistance could be doing the kinds of things that we, uh, we teach, you know, where there's an auxiliary, an underground, a guerrilla force. Um, they could be doing those classic unconventional warfare, um, uh, things, or they could just be providing you intelligence for targeting, which you do see a lot of right now going on in the Ukraine, which is extremely valuable. So that's a deep fight. Our army expects us to maintain a huge portion of the deep fight for them. The, the part, the way, the way we also would see the fight happening is um, in our multi-domain operations kind of concept approach, the adversary is going to take something from us, much like Ukraine. They're going to take something, and then we're going to have to take it back, right? So if you're taking something back, you could expect that there's occupied territory and that there would be a resistance force, right? So the idea of leveraging that resistance force to fight for you on your behalf or to target, it's a big part of the way that we see our, our value proposition in the future. We also see ourselves fighting in the close fight. You know, along that, if there's a linear battlefield, we would see ourselves fighting with a commando unit or a partner soft unit, anything like that. Um, just like right now, we know that there are Ukrainian soft fighting along the front line. We could see ourselves doing that in a targeting role also. And perhaps if we had room to spare, we could actually do some targeting in the rear area also. Um, and then I think the other, the other value proposition that we bring, just like I, I was talking earlier about our partnership with Lithuania, and the ideas that Lithuania had brought to the Ukraine on how to establish a uh, resistance operating concept, we would see ourselves operating on the periphery of a fight also, right? Um, in d other countries, maybe different parts of other countries, much like if you think about Syria, um, U.S. SOF was operating in Syria. There were not very many other conventional forces around. Our conventional forces owned the fight against ISIS in Iraq. Our SOF forces owned the fight against ISIS in Syria. Uh, we can see ourselves doing that somewhat in the future. Like we own an entire theater of operations against uh, an adversary. So it's just another way of kind of breaking down a battlefield and thinking about how I would position myself and what I could do, what, what I could potentially do against an adversary. Uh, or an enemy. So those are just some thoughts on um, integrated deterrence, how we see ourselves fighting in the future, um, and what, what's our contribution. We've had to think about it a lot, obviously. When the uh, resourcing you know, spigot gets tightened down, you really have to think, what's my value proposition? What am I bringing to the fight? Um, and we've had to think about that a lot.
on the recruiting side because they did get asked about recruiting. Obviously, we cannot, you know, really exist without our army, in my, in my situation, the army and its recruiting machine, right? Half of our formation comes from already active duty serving um, officer and enlisted um, soldiers. So we get about half of our recruits from active duty. We get another half of our recruits from the, uh, we would call it like off the street recruiting, we call it x-ray recruiting. They're recruited, you know, from uh, mainstream America. Um, right now, just for everybody's information, our recruiting numbers in SOF, we're not doing too bad. You know, the Army's had a very, very tough go of it recently. Our numbers are still uh, pretty strong. I'm not exactly sure why that is, but the demand for what we're doing is still quite high. Now, that doesn't mean that that won't change in the near future. And obviously, if the, the end strength of the Army goes down, our ability to pull from, you know, that uh, population will go down X percent, you know, along with the size of the Army. Um, but our off-the-street recruiting remains about the same. Our in-service recruiting remains about the same. I'm sure when the Chief of Staff of the Army came, he went over in detail about, hey, what, what ails us in the recruiting uh, world? I could probably go over that too, but I think we all understand COVID hurt us pretty badly. We weren't out there recruiting folks that we wanted to. I think we've got some perception problems about what we do. And I would also say the Chief of Staff of the Army has made all of us recruiters. So, uh, you know, raise your right hand because you're going to get sworn in as a recruiter. But we've had a lot of, even at the, the Special Warfare Center in school where I just came from, uh, we have brought in, you know, high school uh, coaches, teachers, uh, counselors, principals, to uh, our facilities to talk to them about, hey, what is, what's it like to be in the Army? What's it like to be in SOF? Uh, all these kinds of things. We were doing that monthly. I think we still are doing that monthly. We have, you know, VTCs with the Chief of Staff and Vice Chief of Staff of the Army on how we can improve. And again, just like when money spigots get turned on, when people stop coming to your organization, it's kind of a soul-searing moment where you have to look at every one of your um, mechanisms and say, okay, what can I do to make this better? What's slowing down the recruiting pipeline? And I think the fact that the, the CSA was here talking about it, he, he understands that. So he's put out an all call. If there's an impediment in the system, if something is not working, if there's a reason that we can fix or change to improve our recruiting, um, he's willing to hear it. Uh, so I think that's a, that's a good thing. And I think we can, we can improve uh, on our recruiting. We have a few, you know, I, it's interesting because being the SWIC commander where you're running a pipeline all the way from recruiting to, you know, assessment selection, all the way to uh, going through schools, you see I'm running this gigantic pipeline. The Army recruiting system is kind of the same. There are multiple points where a person can fall off, where a person can be held up. And really a lot of this is for, in my uh, opinion, for bureaucratic reasons. One person thinks hey, this is the most important thing going on for this human. If he broke his pinky toe when he was in kindergarten, he can't be in the Army. Um, so we're looking for things like that uh, to, uh, to help us out. But there's a lot of societal stuff going on out there. You know, um, people are overweight. People have criminal records. I think that a lot of folks can't pass our, the ASVAB right now. Maybe they fail one part. I mean, a lot of people hadn't, they've been taking on online classes that had an effect. <laughs> So that's, that's my recruiting thing. And if anybody wants to ask any more questions about that, feel free. I can, I can hit, hit up on anything else. So that's about 20 minutes. We're about 20 minutes in. I will open it up for any questions that anybody has. And it doesn't have to be what we talked about. We can talk about soft, integrated turns, the future, um, recruiting, whatever anybody likes. But I will take on all, uh, all questions if anybody has any. Good afternoon, sir. Jared Hernandez, uh, United States Navy, United States Department of Justice. A uh, 2020 review by the United States Special Operations Command found that there were no systemic ethical failures within the U.S. Special Forces community. Despite these findings, we've continued to witness ethical lapses uh, with strategic implications uh, throughout our forces. Recently, you published a letter in the Special Warfare magazine detailing your view of how to traverse this ethical terrain or minefield. Could you please uh, discuss 
your view of uh, the ethical choices faced by uh, special operations forces and their strategic implications? Ah, great question. You've done your research. I like it. Um, so I, I don't think it's a, a secret uh, to anybody, but SOCOM did a comprehensive review, you know, based on some of these. Um, there were some, there were some ethical issues that, that we were having. I think a lot of these are actually high profile. I'm not, I don't know that it's a trend, but I think that we have to be aware that when a soft operator does something bad, it's going to get a lot of press. It's getting a lot of attention. I think that's the first thing that we have to, to understand about ourselves, right? So as a person who's putting folks through a school, and I'm moved on to a different job, but I'll speak for my former job, I think there's a, there's a couple things going on. I'm going to go off script from my article a little bit, too, and just kind of give my, my view about this. Um, there's a lot to be said for getting the right person for the job, which is one of the things that our selection and our qualification course is working towards, right? Um, which includes an assessment selection that's physically demanding, that has tons of peer eval. I mean, one of the, one of the things that we believe in is basically physically and mentally bring a person to their, um, I don't want to say breaking point, but a point where you know, everything has been torn down about them, right? Then take a look at them and say, what kind of a human being do we have here? You know, put them under, under stressful situations. We let our psychologists do that. We let our um, cadre do that. But another way that we do it, we also let our students do it through extensive peer eval, right? Multiple, multiple looks, multiple different cadre, multiple different peer evals, right? And it's not just a peer eval, if anybody's ever done one that goes one to 10, you know, who's the best, who's the worst? We usually will say things like, okay, you can, you can do a peer eval like that. I'll also offer this up that you can just write down the three worst people that you would never want to deploy with. If there's no worst people, just rank order them. But let's, let's get to understand the people that we're with. Uh, so I think the idea of picking the right people, super important, right? And when I say pick the right people, we have to understand what are they going to do, right? I think what we give people the responsibility to do is extremely important uh, to explain. Like, we are sending people off as part of a small team to operate perhaps in a country where there's no other, you know, uh, U.S. military, okay? That is a huge responsibility just to, to do that, and then we're going to, you know, give them money, weapons, all types of authority to operate. You want to make sure that you have picked the right person to do that. And I think our uh, techniques and methods and thought process going into picking the right people, it's gotten, it's gotten better. I wouldn't say it's gotten a lot better because I think we've always had a pretty good uh, thought process on how we get the right people, but we've tightened it up a little bit, particularly on the number of looks that we're, we're looking at, like, okay, we don't want to get the wrong person. We're going to give the, this guy multiple, multiple looks on how we do this, plus a board at the end to make sure that we got the right person. Okay. Then, after they would pass that selection process to make sure we have the right people, they're going to go to our qualification course, right? And our qualification course is a lot of the same types of things. It's about leadership, learning your military occupational specialty. There's more uh, stress and techniques. There is a uh, culmination exercise that is quite significant where we're testing everything that person has learned, right? Mixed in throughout all of this, and this is something that is new, we have uh, laid out more ethical um, we call it ethical instruction. Usually we're doing this through ethical dilemma practice exercise, PEs, uh, where not only are we teaching, like one of the articles in that magazine, there's a lot of uh, uh, models for ethical decision making, which we're teaching people. I think those are useful. I'm not sure if they're that useful. My perspective on what's useful in teaching people about ethics is um, taking them into scenarios, scenario-based instruction, which we do a lot of. Um, and again, I'll just tell you, when our guys go out there on a battlefield or in another country, they are faced with ethical dilemmas all day long. And those are the kind of things that we're teaching people about. 
Understand when you go to host nation, they will try to bribe you. They will try to give you a kickback with money. There will be money to take. Here's how you could take money. You cannot take money. If you take money, you know, you will, you will basically betray the trust of everything that, that we have and that you have. So I think we've done a lot to work on, on those kinds of things. Now, I'm going to fast forward into the future because I think I believe we're getting a lot of the right people. And that's one of the ways that we're com we've combated this problem. Um, but I think in our operational forces, there's another way of thinking about it. We, don't, we shouldn't over-deploy people. This was General Clark's big thing, like we're over-deploying people. We're, making, we're burning people out. People are making these, these mistakes or these lapses in judgment because they're, they're overly stressed. And I, I believe that also. Um, and I think there's a training aspect to what we're doing also. Um, and thinking about putting the right people in charge of our detachments and command. There's also another part to it that, that where oversight is required. You know, there's, there's, there's little things you know, about, hey, who's in charge of the money on a, on a, on a detachment? Do, do we put an O3 in charge of it, or do we put, a, put an E6 in charge of it? What kind of training do they get to have that? So I think we're attacking you know, what you brought up on all fronts. Um, I'm feeling pretty good uh, about improvements that we've made. Uh, but I'm always vigilant. I, I understand that our nation trusts us. Our nation trusts us with its most difficult problems, right? Um, what we can't have are people that um, betray that trust because then we're not going to get to tackle our nation's most difficult problems, and that's not good for the nation, uh, and that's how I see it. Any follow-up questions on that? Sir, could you mm -hmm. uh, discuss in terms of the rules of engagement? I, I've seen more, uh, and this yep. was searingly so, in the Navy JAG community dealing with sort of the Gallagher okay. effect. both for the JAG community in terms of uh, our advising and uh, guidance and supplementing mm -hmm. of uh, our special operations forces as well as uh, an identity crisis. I, well, that may be too far, but to discuss in terms of rules of engagement and uh, whether or not special operations forces, sometimes under different uh, authorities, Title 50 authorities with different uh, uh, organizations within our government, how that also can uh, cause ethical quandaries for our uh, operators that are used to operating under Title 10. Yeah, well, luckily, we have lots of lawyers in our organization. So if lawyers can save the day, we've got lawyers that are, gonna, that are saving the day. I think what you mentioned, in my opinion, is all about, I'll, I'll go to our ethos first. Our ethos is, you've got a problem, I'm going to solve your problem for you. We are problem solvers of the utmost ability on, in the soft community. What I make sure with our guys and gals is that do not confuse solving problems with breaking rules, right? And rules change, and that's okay, because they change for a very specific reasons, right? And we have to obey those rules. Now, we can push the boundaries of those rules in, a, in the right kinds of way, uh, but it's very important for us to understand authorities. What are my left and right limits? Uh, what can I... What decisions can I make on my own? And what do I need to you know, ask for or submit a con up or, or whatever else? And we're working on that also um, because we are good about operating in amb ambiguous situations, but we also have to understand, hey, um, there are certain things that I run into. This is an extraordinary situa situation. This requires me to be extraordinarily communicative to my uh, chain of command. So I understand. Your thoughts, I'm under, I understand that the Gallagher situation, and I think we are working on those things also, in a, in a good way. I think being the nation's problem solver, that's good. We just have to understand, hey, what's our left and right limits? Awesome, thanks. Sir, please. Okay, hi, my name is Joshua Archibald from the State Department. Um, I did not do my research. <laughs> <laughs> None, nonetheless, um, I'd like to just ask your thoughts about sort of the what you see from your experience yeah. and looking ahead is, is sort of the proper relationship between sort of the combatant commanders, SOCOM, and let's say the ambassadors. 
and sort of the, the in, in the wider picture, how best should sort of DOD and, and state work together um, going forward? And, and sort of on the ground, how should that relationship work and how has it worked in your experience? Thank you. I think uh, probably the, the first time that I ever got to work with the State Department was probably closely was in Afghanistan with uh, some of the PRT missions that we were doing and I got to see a lot of the State Department on the ground and I, that, a lot of that was happening at kind of a, a level I think where it was just humming right along and we, I never had any issues with, with any state uh, folks. I did uh, two six-month uh, rotations as a deputy commander to a special operations task force in OIR and one year as, a, as the commander. In that role I got to see the State Department a lot uh, and I, I got to experience uh, probably four different uh, ambassadors, U.S. ambassadors to Iraq. I got to experience Ambassador Jeffries, you know, in, in, in Syria. I got to see the START teams. I thought, uh, much like our conversation earlier, I think that we just had to figure out, like, what are the ground, we, we'd call it terms of reference. You know, what are, what's important to you, what's important to me, what can I do? What can you do? How do we work together? I think, I think from a military perspective, um, we have to be very comfortable with the idea that I don't control the State Department. They're not in my the chain of command. I can't order the State Department around. Um, but we all have the same, hopefully, goals uh, in mind. So how do we have a, have a common you know, interest? And how do we work together best? And I saw a lot of ambassadors and I saw a lot of uh, commanders that I thought did a very good job on uh, doing that, on working together, um, not ordering each other around, but laying out, hey, here's, here's what we've got for information, here's how the battlefield is laid out, um, here's what we're going to do, what are you going to do, uh, Mr. Ambassador, that's coming up, that would, you know, how can we synchronize, how can we work together? Um, I, I actually thought, from the ambassadors and the commanders I saw, that that worked pretty well. And again, I think that probably wouldn't have happened as well, I'd say 25 years ago. But because of what we were doing together in the, the Middle East, I think it, it works a lot better, works a lot better now than it used to. And it's, uh, I think it's just more about I'm much more willing to get along with the State Department. There are things that we can leverage and do that are critical to our mission, and I think vice, vice versa. I think the fact that Army Special Operations also has civil affairs in it is another you know, leverage point to say we do something that's similar, not the same, but similar um, in providing some governance functions. I also think we do a lot more, kind of goes toward the training piece. You know, how has our training changed over the years? We do a lot more at the very lowest level of how do you operate as a captain or E6 in an embassy, right? How does an embassy work? Because half the battle is just understanding um, what do you do? What is your culture like? Um, so we spend a lot of money on bringing former ambassadors in to do role playing for us. We have, a, I think it's almost a two-week course on how to operate in an embassy. And so I think those kinds of things um, enable us, and I think the Army in general, uh, to operate in that interagency environment a little bit more. You bet. General, I have a question from Jay Soma. You had very eloquently talked about sort of the competitive piece to great power, but then there's yeah. also the fight piece. Yep. And the, the question coming from Jay Soma is, you know, what is the expectation in regards to integrated deterrence and, and the way ahead with respect to not just the United States uh, Special Operations Forces, but working with uh, foreign Special Operations Forces? Uh, and they're sort of getting to the capacity piece of types of training and exercise in sort of building a musculature to uh, potentially address Chinese aggression uh, sure. in the region? So in that regard, I mean, I can use some geography as a, as a, a point to uh, help. I think when we look at Europe right now, 
and European SOF. We have tons of uh, SOF architecture in Europe. There's the NATO SOF headquarters. We've got uh, SOCIR. We had fought, either whether it was in Afghanistan, Iraq, or Syria, with almost every European SOF partner that we've had. Our connective tissue with European SOF is about as deep uh, maybe the Latin American countries, we have a few more countries that we could say are better, but the majority of the countries that we operate with in Europe, we have a fantastic, tight relationship with uh, to a great degree. I mean, even when they show up on the battlefield, we, we know what their strengths, weaknesses are, authorities, and a lot of times they're helping us. It's not just like, hey, we're the big guy in the room. Most of these European soft uh, countries are bringing their own unique authorities and skill sets that are very helpful. So that's kind of the gold standard, I think, on the, Euro the European side. What I think we'd like to do is to take that model and say, hey, I'd like a lot of other places to look like Europe to some degree. Maybe I can't get there, but at least I know uh, what right looks like and how do I build partner capacity in certain areas. Because I've gotten there in one, one area, one GCC. Uh, I want to get there in some others like Indo-PACOM and whatnot. And I think our goal is We've seen, we've seen what Europe looks like, and we've had, we've had a couple wars that were able to bring us together. How do we do that uh, in Indo-PACOM with our partners out there? And it could be more, more JSET training, it could be more exercises, it could be bringing more of our partners to our country, which we're trying to do you know, a lot of, um, whether it's coming to our military freefall course, coming to our qualification course. We want to, to open up the floodgate, and because we're, we're trying to say, do exactly what you're talking about. Hey, how do I improve relationships and improve capacity with my partners really all throughout the world to get to what we have in, uh, in Europe? I think, right on. Anybody else? Sir, I'm gonna jump in again just okay. personally, why Save not? Save the day, why take, not? Take the opportunity. Um, Ukraine. Sure. To your point that you just made, which is excellent, um, w in this town sometimes we, we have like a flavor du jour and we focus on it and then we move on to something else. I can't help but to think I was an original plank holder for Section 1206, now 333. When I think about building partner capacity, it's, it's been popular, less popular, popular again, things come and go. Um, if we had not been training the Ukrainians for a decade, if we had not been sort of building that capacity, I mean, where would we be today in terms of, you know, providing them with very sophisticated weaponry like HIMARS and, and some of the other sophisticated work that the Ukrainian military is doing right now yeah. to defend their homeland? And that, that might serve as an excellent exemplar for other theaters of operation that um, where there's a David and Goliath dynamic, the soft personnel have the ability to build capacity to, to sort of create the imposition of costs that uh, get into the psyche of our adversaries and that kind of thing. Yeah, so uh, before this little session kicked off, we, we had a discussion. I, I quickly went through, hey, what was our contribution, I think, to the Ukraine fight? So I'll do that for everybody really quick. You know, we, we had a, uh, a company and uh, three of our teams forward in the Ukraine since around 2014, heel to toe, meaning constant presence in the Ukraine, um, which is a huge investment you know, for us, while at the same time that we were fighting in the Middle East and we were sending um, our teams around the world, but we put a very good effort, uh, a large effort, into the Ukraine for a couple of different reasons. This was right post uh, the invasion by Russia of, the, of Crimea, and occupation of Crimea. And I think there's four big contributions that we made that we'd also like to you know, replicate. Because we look at this and say, this is pretty effective. Uh, one was we were able to work with the Ukrainian SOF and somewhat transform them from a Russian kind of based Spetsnaz organization to a, a more Western model of uh, SOF. Think U.S. Special Forces or British SAS, et cetera. So that was one line of effort. Uh, and we were doing that through training their folks that were coming off uh, the front line in the Donbass area. So they were fighting in Donbass quite a bit. 
The other piece that we did, and we're very good at this, is we, we helped them build a, uh, a schoolhouse for their uh, uh, soft folks, right? We've done that in Iraq, we've done that in Colum Colombia, we've done that in a lot of different places throughout the world. That's a very effective way of building partner capacity forward. We did that in the Ukraine. Um, the other piece that I'd say that we did was we brought in partners to help us with the problem, kind of to the point about um, Europe is a pretty developed theater for us. There are certain partners, particularly in the Baltic region, that were, I would say, ahead of where we were thinking about resistance and where even the, uh, what the Ukrainians were thinking about. But they had a kind of a, a collective mindset on the idea of like, hey, we're not sure that we can hold Russia off, um, so we have to make ourselves, you know, like porcupine. You know, it's tough to eat a porcupine, right? Um, so we have to make ourselves from a resistance perspective, a total defense perspective, uh, building territorial defense forces, all these kinds of things. Our partners from the Baltics helped us with that. We teamed up with them from a soft perspective to make Ukraine a tougher target. Um, and I think we we're very successful kind of on that team approach to resistance and building resistance. We were even able to change the laws in the Ukraine um, to do that. We also had a hand in building one of their CTC sites their training sites in the Ukraine. Now, that was a seven-year effort. That's not very exciting. You know, no, ex no real big, you know, explosions and things happening. But that investment, you know, we think helped blunt the initial invasion of the Russians, right, on the, on the airfield and other areas. Uh, we also see the, the benefits to this because we have huge inroads with the Ukrainian SOF right now who also have huge inroads with their resistance forces that are fighting behind in occupied territory, um, who do a lot of targeting for the, for the Ukrainians and whatnot. So um, if you imagine a, a situation where that wasn't happening, um, I don't want to deal in hypotheticals or counterfactuals, but it wouldn't have turned out as well. That's my, my honest opinion. It could have, the whole thing could have collapsed um, from the get-go if we weren't careful, or we might not have this you know, change. Oh, I think a lot of, the, uh, a lot of the, the bandwidth right now is taken by you know, the HIMARS piece and all this kind of stuff, but we have to remember HIMARS need, need targets you know, deep, and that's not all coming from technology. A lot of that is coming from the people that are operating behind uh, Russian lines. So I, that's my, my answer. But yeah, that's something that we want to replicate. We look at that and say that was a pretty good model. We could have probably even done that better. Um, and we want to take that and say, you know, we, we can do this in other places. And the, yeah, the idea of integrated deterrence, let me just say this also. I'm not too worried about talking about these things because if our adversaries don't realize that we're doing this, it probably doesn't help as much. So I think, I think most of our European partners are okay uh, telling Russia that, hey, this, was a, this is a plan. Like, if you, you think that we look soft, we're not easy. You know, you might even get through the first 100 miles, but after that, it's going to be hard. You, you'll wish you had not have done this. Uh, and I think that's a legitimate form of de deterrence. And I think other nations in the world are looking at that too and saying, mm, it might look like an easy target, maybe it's not an easy target. Thanks, sir. You bet. Hey, sir. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Dr. Sean McFate, um, faculty member here. At awesome. College of Security Affairs. So earlier you were talking about the role in GPC of, of SF and SOF, and yep. I understand, of course, that there's some big army influence, and they're thinking, and you talked about the deep fight in yes. sort of a conventional battle, and it, it just, you know, there's certainly a role for SF there, but it seems to me like the, the minor role is, isn't, if, there, if there's one lesson we learn from the Cold War in GPC is that you win, the, you win such a fight not in conventional battles, which can go nuclear, you do it through proxy wars and okay. stuff like that. And that seems to be a major strength of SF and in fact why it was created in the early 60s. Is there, you know, is, is, this, is the drive for the deep fight, A, am I misunderstanding what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. No, 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 okay. you're not misunderstanding at all. I, yeah. First, I guess what I would say is I, I believe that yes, there's a huge, like if you think about the Cold War, why were we created? You know, as, as uh, John F. Kennedy was talking about, hey, to fight wars that are as old as time itself, but new to us, 
these kind of counterinsurgency fights, uh, irregular warfare, right? Yeah, that's exactly what we were created to do. Uh, and, and we can do it, and we do it well, as you saw over the last 20 years. And we can, I can have the t-shirt, put the bumper sticker on, I can do that all day, and, and I wanna make sure that everybody understands that that's what we do. But when it comes to talking about, hey, what's our value proposition to the, to the army, uh, who has to think about, um, and it's not just the army, it's the, our service in general, we have to also think about, hey, if we had to go into a large-scale combat situation, what would you do? First of all, how would you deter or prevent that? Um, but second of all, and maybe even more importantly to the talking point is, if we had to fight, what would you do? So when I'm talking about the deep fight, that's really what, I, what we have to stress uh, with our military. Like, well, there's, a, there's a part for us. For a long time, for a long time, I think we basically said, you know, that's that, that large-scale combat stuff, that's not really our thing. We're, we're doing a lot of the other kinds of stuff. My position on that, and I think my boss would agree, is that, oh, actually, we're actually really good at this. And uh, I'll, I think a la Syria, I'll, and I think the Ukraine is another good example. We're very good at this to help to fight a large-scale combat operation piece also. So I agree. We're very good at what you've talked about. Uh, I didn't talk about it because I think that's kind of a, a well-known piece. But what I want to make sure that I'm getting out to, uh, you know, the Army is that, hey, if it, if it came to like this whole, if we're fighting a large-scale combat operation, we're of great utility uh, in that arena as well. Big. I think big. I think, uh, I think we play a big role in that. I think the idea of building resistance forces in certain areas and, and fighting those resistance forces is huge, should not be understated. And I think we've understated that part of our um, value proposition for, for a long time. So that's my... Okay. So you're not yeah. saying we have a new priority, you're just saying that we can do these other things too and... You're yeah, absolutely. I, I, think, I think we have to make sure that we're telling people like, I, I can do this large scale combat piece and here's my role in that as well. Um, I'm not gonna say that's a new priority because to me, that's very similar to like unconventional warfare, which is one of our, the pillars of, our, of what we do. So I'm not gonna say that that's different than what we're doing. I think what we have to do on our side is to make sure like, okay, I've said I can do this. I've put it out there, I've thrown it down. I, can, I own the deep fight for you. Okay, if I say that, what does that mean that I have to do? I have to train in a specific way, slightly different than what I've been training to do. I have to have the right equipment uh, to operate in that way. Um, so I think, and I have to pick the right people, as we talked about. So when I say those things, it doesn't mean that I'm changing priority. It means I, I'm just taking my old skills and kind of refocusing, refocusing them in some different ways. I think, I think over the last 20 years, I'm not going to say that we, we got off track. I'm going to say we had to do some things that took away from some of our skill sets that we've been operating with normally. I think overall, the 20 years of war have made us a lot better. But I, I would also say there were some things like we got, we've gotten away from that we need to refocus on in some ways. Uh, whether it's maritime operations, which we weren't doing a whole lot of, thinking about our, our military free fall program in the sense of how are we gonna defeat radar because that wasn't what we were doing with it before. Uh, the idea of using stingers, which we weren't training on for a long time because our adversaries did not have aircraft. Uh, there's, there's some other ways, of, the idea of um, communicating in a contested comms environment, you know, how are, we, how are we doing that? These are the things that we have to be thinking about. We can take all these skills and apply them to a, you know, a regular warfare, or we can apply them, apply them to a regular warfare piece of high intensity warfare also. Um, I think the idea of, I mean, there's lots of different technological pieces uh, that we're, we're working on, but I think the focus of what we're doing remains pretty much the same. You bet. Good, good, good question. Sir, I got another question uh, okay. from uh, Jay Soma, and it goes uh, like this. Sir, could you share your perspective on SOF's uh, vision and strategy, especially in the context and in relationship to uh, SOLIC and SOCOM? Well, I think that we, we have a new commander 
in, uh, at SOCOM, took over a couple weeks ago, General Fenton. I don't know that he's going to change our vision. I think w the things that I've laid out are the things that he pretty much, I think, has as a vision. You know, also the idea of like the, how we fit into large scale uh, combat operations, Russia and China in the NDS, how are we focused on those? Uh, two adversaries, what's our role in that, how are we Im imposing costs, uh, et cetera. I think uh, if I had to channel for ASD Solik right now, one of their big focuses is cuts. You know, we talked about recruiting. The Army is being, you know, cut. I think whether the Army had met its recruiting goal or not, they'd still be facing cuts. Uh, nobody is immune from that. Um, whether they're in the, you know, the navies, the SEALs are, everybody, everybody's facing cuts. So a lot of, I think, what ASD SOLIC in combination with SOCOM is doing uh, is about, hey, here is, here is what you shouldn't cut. Here's what we consider to be sacred. Here's our value proposition. As a matter of fact, I, think, I don't think you should cut anything. We're so valuable. So I think they're working on those types of things. We're all talking with each other about that. Um, how we go forward about, hey, you know, we think we should maintain. You know, there is a, uh, there's an idea that, hey, we were at a certain, SOF was at a certain number, uh, September 10th of 2001. Now you've grown, you know, this much. We would like to get you back down to pre-9-11 numbers because the logic would go, because you grew to fight those specific wars, now those wars are done. Now we should get you back down to, you know, what we'd consider right size. So we're working on, you know, how to, um, you know, why we're more valuable than that, all right? I also think SOCOM is focused on a lot of the technological pieces because they have AVSOC. They've got some other services under them that there's a technological piece to how we advance in the world. You know, in the Army, you know, we have technological pieces also, but our platform is human, you know, more than anything else. And we also have the most personnel of any soft formation, but if you look at money, I mean, aircraft cost a lot of money. That's where we spend a lot of our money and how we're revamping uh, that side of our uh, portfolio. Um, so those are the big ones uh, that I think SOCOM and ASD SOLIC are working on right now. What, what are we doing to kind of, you know, what's our value proposition? Like everybody's thinking about this. And then, hey, there's a technological piece that we're looking at that would say, hey, you've asked us to look at these two NDS uh, threats. We're looking at it. As a matter of fact, we're, we're revamping from a technological piece. And in some cases, we're revamping from an organizational piece uh, as well to meet those new threats. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, sir. Commander Scott Douglas, United States Navy, uh, CISA Navy uh, faculty this year. Wanted to pick up actually from your, your last response and uh, Chuck invoking Soft Vision 2022. And I wanted to, to start with, to what degree is your job changing the conversation when it's put to you that yeah. the, the, those wars are done, past tense, what's your value proposition for the GPC? Yeah. To what extent is part of Soft's job to say, well, those, those wars may not be done for the United States yeah. or may not be done for our partners and we need to be able to build partner capacity in that yeah. direction. Yeah. And then kind of related to that, if it's not done, and it may be for the U.S. or not, and if it is of interest to our partners, yeah. how do you continue to train towards that yeah. without jeopardizing what you said you needed to do with things about the deep fight and, and others? Right, right. Well, first of all, I think at the, uh, at the end of the day or at the beginning of the day, we have to say, hey, we do protect the homeland and we do uh, combat terrorist threats. So that, that is like our number one tagline. We protect America. On the, on the other side, the idea that a lot of the forces that we work with around the world are CT forces, okay? We recognize that um, and we're regionally oriented. Army soft is, not every, not every uh, one of our sister services are regionally oriented, but we completely recognize that many of the forces we work with are CT in nature. But I'll tell you, I'll tell you something else that when we go on these, like a J set and we're working with a CT force, we'll usually consider like, okay, well, there is a nexus to this also that could be counter PRC, it could be whatever, counter Russia, uh, right? 
Um, so we're always thinking about that. Just because on the surface it says only CT, we should always be thinking about, okay, well there's counter uh, the NDS adversaries in this piece also. So we're thinking about that. We understand, hey, CT is important to our partners. Keeping partners is important because if we don't keep partners, other people will get these partners, right? And part of this, to, in my view, is a denial. We're denying access, we're denying, you know, these adversaries, you know, space, human terrain, whatever, right? I think that's one of our great uh, contributions, which we do harp on, I think, pretty effectively. On, the, on the, the resistance side, I'll also say this. Our job, when we're going forward, and talking to our other partners and we're working with them. Not every um, partner special operations force thinks about the world that we do. Maybe they see their world as very niche, like all I do is CT. Our job is to, I think as leaders in this world, would be to kind of reshape their perspective on that and say, you know what? You should think about the things that we think about too. Like we think about CT, we think about coin, we think about all these other things. You should also think about unconventional warfare, resistance operations, the things that work against uh, uh, the global adversaries that we have. So I think from a variety of different ways, we, we keep CT at the top, but we also understand like I can meld a lot of that into a lot of different ways uh, when I'm thinking about it. Um, I think that's been, I think that's a good, well first of all I think it's true, it is what we do. I think it's a pretty effective way of conveying to other people like no, no, this is our value proposition. This is a huge value proposition for, for all of us. Thanks, sir. You bet. Scott, thanks. And I think we have one more question here. We'll make this the last question. Thank okay. you very much. Great. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Lieutenant Colonel Picker from Estonia. Okay. Uh, uh, there was planned uh, resistance call for Ukraine uh, starting from 27th of February, but uh, suddenly the war kicked off 24th of February. Yes. And, uh, uh, they are they are doing 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 currently very well in in uh, when we speak about resistance, especially targeting. But uh, uh, I'm interested about your point of view. What is the key for a nation to resist against uh, enemy as Russia is, and what we can how we can support them? Thank you. Yeah, well, I think uh, getting back to these questions about the ebb and flow of. Uh, our view of partners and partnering with people and building partner capacity. I think that uh, the Afghanistan piece for us was a kind of a low point in some ways of investing in, in partner capacity. That did not work out, I think, the way that we would have hoped that it worked out. I think on the Ukrainian side, I think that what you see is a country that nearly at every level was built to resist uh, the Russians, and I think maybe it wasn't always that way, but maybe after the, the Donbas peace, the Crimea peace, they, the Ukrainian government at every level stepped up its idea of like, we must resist uh, Russia. I talked to every Ukrainian student that came through our qualification course, and one of the things that struck me about, about them uh, was they were very clear-eyed about what's the threat. Russia is the threat. We will do everything that we can to beat the Russians. We will never, like they're, they're telling me this, I'm not even really asking, but they were like virulent. We will beat the Russians. These people are the enemy. You know, we will keep them out of our country. So it did not surprise me. Well, it, it surprised me a little bit, but their ideas on, on who the adversary was and what they were gonna do, very clear. I think that how to support them. I think, first of all, I think the idea of like exporting the, the resistance uh, operating concept of them, and I know the vault Estonia was part of that. Um, teaching them how to do it, and this is kind of pre-war, but then hey, how do we help? I think, um, I think we're helping right now significantly. I don't want to go into too much detail on what we're doing. Um, I think for them, I mean, the idea that they've, they've won a few battles and they're, they're turning the tide, I think that's good too, because I think more support is going to, to come in also. Um, so we'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave that one open on what we, what we can do, but we are watching very carefully, and I, I'm, I hope for them for the best, for sure. Thank you. 
Well, sir, it's been an honor and a privilege having you here today. Your insights have been fantastic. So thank you so much on behalf of CISA North and South for being here today. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Best of luck in the, uh, in the future here in this course. Thank you.